Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I maybe took too much caffeine to the dome right before we started, so I'm a little bit uh, on a caffeine high, but I'm also excited about this week's episode because... This is like a personal, it reminds me of good times when me and you first started doing the podcast together and uh, it, it takes me back just looking at the notes. So I'm going to shut my mouth and hand it back over to you. Good times indeed. Okay. Well, um, about a month ago, not when we first started six years ago, or what, but uh, about a month ago, we did a second selection from my half of the out of print guerrilla copywriting audio book. And it was so popular. We thought we'd do a third one. And here's some background. 16 years ago, I produced an audiobook with my late friend and mentor, Jay Conrad Levinson, author of best selling Guerrilla Marketing series. Jay and I originally thought about doing a book together. That never happened. So we did an audiobook. It's out of print now. So I'm free to share my half of the material. I took a look at it the other day and I got to admit it's still pretty good. A couple things need to be updated. A lot has happened in the last 16 years, but for the most part, we've got eternal principles that are completely workable today. Updated them a little bit. Um, I'm going to share seven more tips from this audiobook, but first, I want to share this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims, and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So before I jump in, Nathan, anything you want to say about the nostalgia of all of this? Ah, uh, man, one of my favorite audiobooks, and I again, I mentioned it last time, but so far ahead of its time, and uh, I. I I think that if it was re-released now, it would probably probably find a good audience. Well, okay. Keep your eyes peeled. Something like that might happen in a different form without the word gorilla. So here are seven tips for today. Number one, remember, this is counterintuitive until you've been doing it for a while. People buy more of what they've already bought. So if you're like me, you like novelty, variety new ideas, trying to do the same thing different ways, trying new things. And that's not an unusual trait for creative people. But I want to tell you something about my actual behavior. That is what I do on a regular basis. I've been with the same auto insurance company for at least 30 years. And this is despite the gecko, the emu, the duck, I haven't craved novelty in auto insurance year after year. I keep buying the same thing. Think about that. This is a guy who craves novelty, but you know, every three months or six months or whatever it is, every six months, same company. So as a copywriter, keep this in mind. Don't try to sell people something entirely new. Yes, it can work. It can work to come up with something entirely new in the market. And it's easy to point to Steve Jobs, who really revolutionized the world and put a dent in the universe and created the world's most valuable company along with Steve Wozniak and several others. It's easy to point to Jobs and Apple. It's a lot harder to pull off. What people usually buy, usually, is a new version of what they already have or already want. Some of the most profitable copy you can write will offer your customers more of what they already bought from you or a better version of what they have. Let's go back to Silicon Valley for a second. When you look at stats for tech startups, where most of the new ideas are attempted to be put into business and really scale up these days, the success rate is estimated to be somewhere between 10% and 33%. That means between six out of nine out of every 10 fail. In the rest of the business world, completely new ideas are even rarer and harder to make work. 
And when we get down to copy, it's a much better bet to find a new way to sell people more of what they've already bought than to try and find something new to sell them. I have a client who has an average order value or AOV of between $200 and $240 on each of his promotions. That means, on average, customers pay him $200 or more. But it doesn't mean that he's selling individual units that cost $200. They're much less, typically $60, $50, $40. What happens is he offers upsells with really attractive bulk discounts and solid reasons for buying more. The copy works and the customers buy. People are pretty happy with his products, too. I mean, yeah, it helps that the product works, and that way customers come back for more. So remember... The greatest cost as a marketer you will ever incur, your biggest expense that you're creating for your client as a copywriter is making the sale, the cost of getting the customer in the first place. So the best way to go profitable as fast as possible is to sell them more of what they already want or what they already bought and were happy with. It's as simple as that. What's been your experience with this? Exactly that. Two things I want to say. The shootout at the OK Corral, the reason why it's so famous is because it was so rare. People think, oh, all of the Wild West was that way. But it was because it was such a rare thing that it made such a huge impact. Same thing with Apple. Apple is a very rare story. It doesn't happen very often. And that's why it's so remarkable. So don't think that the Wild West was all shootouts at the OK Corral. And don't think that business is all Apple re- in, in, or you know revolutionizing uh, a marketplace. It's not that way. And then second, the, the uh, upsell page of any funnel that I write is always, hey, you bought this, you already said you want it. You want to buy some more instead of guessing of another thing that you might want to buy. I'll just give you what you already told me you wanted to buy. It works great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. And that's interesting. I didn't know that about shit at, at the OK Corral, but that's an interesting data point. Thank you. All right. Number two, number two. OK, so you got to use humor. You got to. Right. Yeah. This is always a problem. And, you know, the reason we want to use humor is. We want to keep our copy interesting. So we figure a little humor will keep the prospect reading and endear ourselves to them. Good so far. But when humor distracts from the sale, listen closely to this. When humor distracts from the sale, when it breaks the tension your prospect needs to feel, to realize they have a problem and need to do something about it, then your humor is working against making the sale. And that's no good. So what do you do? First, remember, there are other ways to keep copy interesting that don't hurt the sale. These almost always involve bringing people into your copy. People talking about having the same problem your prospect has now, as one example. Talking about how their lives have changed since they got your product and solved the problem, as another example. It's probably not funny, but people with the problem your product solves will find it interesting. Wait, you're saying that it's your personality to be funny. You are the class clown. You're always joking with your friends, right? So you still got to use humor after everything I just told you? Okay, well, there is one pretty surefire way you can use humor that moves the sale forward. And that is to make fun of the problem. Not the person who has the problem, but the problem itself in a lighthearted way. Now, you can't do this in every situation, and especially health situations, it's going to be really hard. But you can make fun of the problem in a lot of other ways. So my late friend, John Cantu, I've mentioned him on this podcast before. He was a comedy guru back in the day. He helped run the club here in San Francisco that gave a start to Margaret Cho, Robin Williams, Bobby Slayton, Dana Carvey, Paula Poundstone, and many others who went on to fame and fortune elsewhere. So my friend Cantu, before he worked at the Holy City Zoo, he worked as a carny, you know, a pitch man, the county fairs, years earlier. 
And one of the things he used to sell was the chamois, that super absorbent cloth. Part of his pitch involved the household dog. He would talk about a golden retriever and then say, or as you may call it, your golden reliever. That always got a laugh, help people visualize one problem the chamois could solve, namely when the dog peed on the floor. And they really do, as you know, sometimes. So that's the best way to use humor if you can find a way to work it in. But remember, humor or no humor, everything in your copy has to move the prospect towards the action you want them to take. So if you can find humor that truly passes this test, go for it. Nathan, you got a good sense of humor, but I bet you don't put a lot of jokes in your copy. Hmm? I avoid humor in my copy versus when I'm selling in person, humor works great, but in writing, it's so hard to convey humor properly. It's there's no like humor text or no humor font or no, just like there's no sarcasm font. So it doesn't work as well in copy. I will say though, that if somebody does want to study a master of copy and humor friend of the show, Kevin Rogers, who's been on a couple of times, he pulls it off and he's one of the few people that I know that pulls it off consistently. Yeah, I'll agree with you. And I'd say one thing about Kevin is he knows humor 360. He knows he knows a whole world of humor. He even knows it professionally. He's done it, stand up, and he knows copy. He knows copy 360. So he knows where the intersections are. Yep. But you, you'd better really know that or you're taking, I'd say, a risk that's too big. Yeah, it just it's very hard to get it to translate through the written word. It is. Okay, number three, the Gorilla Copywriting four-point fail-safe copy formula. Well, you got to give credit where credit is due. This did not originate in you know the the jungles of of insurgency. This what I'm about to tell you originated with the great copywriter Ted Cooper, who I met in the early 2000s. At that time, Ted already had an impressive track record. He had written some of the early ads for Apple. There's that Apple again and Intuit, both of which later grew to be Silicon Valley powerhouses. The formula I'm going to share with you is something Ted developed during the dot-com craze. Startups were hiring hordes of recent college graduates who knew nothing, and I mean nothing, about marketing in general or copywriting in particular. Not that things are all that different today. Ted would give these seminars to eager young staffers, and he needed something you could put on an index card to help them with their thinking. And this is what he came up with. One, make your claim. Two, prove it is so. Three, ask your prospect to act. Four, leave out everything else. That's pretty cool, right, Nathan? Make mm -hmm. your claim, prove it so, ask your prospect to act, leave out everything else. It's nifty. There is a weakness, though, if you think about it, and that is the first two steps. It's until you know your way around the block, and you have to have gone around the block a few times to know your way around the block, it's hard to decide which claim to make, number one. And beyond that, number two, prove it so. Most people have no earthly idea about how to prove anything. We've covered both of those things in some valuable detail on other episodes of this podcast. Nevertheless, even doing this badly is better than what most people do, quote unquote, intuitively. One, make your claim. Two, prove it so. Three, ask your prospect to act. And four, leave out everything else. Thoughts? Uh, it's just simple. And so many times us copywriters, we love to overcomplicate things. And sometimes we think 15,000 word sales letter is better because whatever, uh, we can add all kinds of extra selling points in there, but yeah, just getting straight to the point. What do they want to hear? What do they want to know? I think of the door to door salesman and you got 30 seconds to grab somebody's attention and get them to pay attention to you. That formula right there works better than it. Make your claim, prove it so, and then ask them to take action, especially today when we're so busy and we are so used to 
60 second TikTok videos, man, it's more important now than it ever was. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Number four, take a tip from the journalists. When I first started out as a journalist, back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, uh, reporters and copywriters were supposed to be on the opposite side of the fence. That's because reporters were supposed to be reporting the facts without fear or favor. And copywriters were taking a very intentional biased point of view in favor of the product they were promoting. These days, the line has blurred a lot, especially on the journalist side of things. But even if we go back to the imaginary purity we pretended to have in the days of old, there are a handful of things that work equally well for both fact-based reporters and product-promoting copywriters. So let's talk about three of them. One, start with an exciting hook or a lead. Now, it's important to remember that traditionally the journalist and the copywriter are going for different goals. The journalist wants to arouse enough interest so you will rapidly read the entire article. And maybe they will win a Pulitzer Prize. But the reporter is not trying to get you to read more so that you buy a product. The copywriter, of course, wants to arouse enough interest so you'll keep reading all the way through. But when you're the copywriter, you also want to create the emotion and set the tone so that the path you are about to take your prospect on has the highest possible probability of resulting in the prospect buying the product. And there's a big difference, right? But the top level purpose is the same in both cases, to capture attention and keep the reader reading. Number two, use quotes to dramatize your point. When you quote another person, you're adding a subtle form of social proof. If you quote someone with authority, you add credibility. This works equally well and pretty much the same for both journalists and copywriters. Three, use statistics and other news events to make what you're saying more relevant and believable. Stats and news events can be used to bolster the truth and they can be used to deceive. In 1954, a statistician named Daryl Huff published a book called How to Lie with Statistics. According to his publisher, it became the best-selling book on statistics in the second half of the 20th century. I know for a fact that it's the only book on statistics I ever bought. Nevertheless, I recommend using statistics only to bolster a true point. There's a boomerang cost for lying, especially in advertising, and it may take a while to find its way back to you but you don't want to spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder. Not much to add to that other than the fact that chargebacks and getting your process, your account, your uh, credit processing or your payment processing, processing accounts shut down or getting bad word of mouth of people uh, happens a lot faster nowadays with the internet. And yeah, man, don't risk it. It makes even for the short-term gains, it makes long-term business miserable, so don't do it. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. All right, next, uh, number five. Only use graphics, including photos, when they support your copy. So graphics can work a couple of ways in an ad or on the web. Either they advance the sale by increasing the prospect's desire, or they can make your offer more real by helping your prospect visualize literally what they're going to get. Suppose you're selling a riding lawnmower. I live in a city now, so this is somewhat of a foreign concept to me, but I grew up in the suburbs and we didn't have a riding lawnmower. We had a little, you know, hand, hand mower. Anyway, I did a little quick research and showed me that the global market for riding lawnmowers last year was $11.24 billion, even bigger than the global market for guitars, which was only $10.3 billion. Now, all I can say is that's a lot of guitars and a lot of riding lawnmowers. So a video of what your lawn looks like when you're sitting on the seat of your mower might help with the sale. But impressionistic, gauzy images of the parts of the riding mower, as if in a dream, might not help. The point is graphics should never be used to make your ad look hip or fashionable or pretty. 
unless what you are actually selling is hip, fashionable, and pretty. Now, graphics is a, like a, almost an avocation of yours. I mean, you know a lot about this, Nathan. You're good at it. What, what do you think? Uh, for web, especially nowadays, because so much selling is done on the web, a lot of times hero images, the very first image that people see, a lot of people want like a technical picture or a picture of the software or a picture of something. And what I found over and over again is the ideal target avatar enjoying the results of what you get always converts better, especially as the first image people see. If you see happy people enjoying the results of the product, it always makes me always makes other people want to read more of the sales page. So yeah, I, I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, you, you just made me think of the first episode of Mad Men, um, where Don Draper says, Happiness. Basically, that's what we sell. We sell happiness. Mm -hmm. Well, we're thinking about there wasn't a lot of good stuff for advertising in there, but there were a few good things for copywriting. All mm -hmm. right. Number six. Don't sell prevention. Sell the cure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, especially if you're new, young, in your 20s, just getting into copywriting. Every new idealistic marketer doesn't believe this. So don't sell prevention, sell the cure, but every experienced marketer does. This realization comes after the time when you have banged your head against the wall one too many times. And you have to have come to the sometimes sad but inevitable conclusion. It was the same one Abraham Lincoln came to when he said, human nature doesn't change. It was as true then as it is now. Um, if you're one of those people who can see the future and therefore you take preventative action ahead of time to avoid the worst, I understand your loneliness and it's the constant arguments you have with people who don't see things the way you do. Because most people don't operate that way. And it's foolish for you as a copywriter to wish, hope, pretend, or imagine that they do or they will. They won't. Most people who are sick will pay through the nose to get well again, but far fewer people will spend good money to prevent getting sick in the first place. Mm -hmm. If you sell something that prevents problems, the trick is to get them to see the future problem they will have. They will have if they don't get your product. See that product is real now so they can make it go away by buying your product. But it's still much easier to sell a cure than prevention. One of the hardest things in the world to sell is life insurance. The only way you could sell it as a cure is, well, there is no way. It's a preventative period. Cabot Robert, former lawyer who became a motivational speaker and a sales trainer said, when you're in someone's home, the way to sell life insurance is to back the hearse up to the front door. Finally, let me say this. If your mission in life is to change human nature, then start a nonprofit because that's what your business is going to be anyway. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to say if you go to your local bakery, the only people buying sugar-free baked goods are the people who already have diabetes. And it's because nobody buys sugar-free stuff to prevent diabetes. They only buy it when they're trying to avoid the cost of already having the problem. And one thing, I mean, there are preventative things out there for sale. And sometimes as a copywriter, you're going to have to sell something that's not a cure. It's a preventative measure. And the one thing that I have learned is the disease is the monster in the room and while I'm playing video games and it's in my peripheral vision and I'm not really paying, I know it's there, but I'm not paying attention. It's kind of fuzzy and out of focus. When you sell a preventative measure, your job is to make that monster forefront, point out how there's venom dripping from its fangs, point out how there's blood dripping from its claws, point out how its yellow eyes are focused right on you and really make it real, rub salt in that wound, agitate it. And that's 
the key to selling prevention. But if you have the choice, always sell a cure. <laughs> really well, really well stated. That's good. Thank you. All right. Um, number seven, people want what they can't have, and you can use this to create urgency. So one of humanity's biggest problems is that we procrastinate. That is, we hesitate to take action sometimes when there's no good reason to procrastinate. As a copywriter, you have a few tools to help your prospect cure this problem. The first one is to set a deadline. You can do this a number of ways. You can simply close down an offer after the deadline. You can take away a sale price and return to the full price after the deadline. Or you can take away bonuses after the deadline. There are many ways you can use a deadline to create urgency. The key thing is to make it very clear that it's in your prospect's best interest to act now rather than to act later. Mm -hmm. Another way to cure procrastination on the part of your prospects is to limit quantities available. If you don't put up a notification on your site of how many are left, then you're adding uncertainty to a feeling of scarcity on the part of your prospect. And this is a very powerful way to spur action and turn maybes into yeses. And the final way is to polarize your market. Some people might think of this approach means offending people to see who stays with you, but you don't need to go that far. You can simply say, this might not be for you. It's not for everyone. A statement like that forces a person to decide whether or not they are one of the people it's for. And if they are, it becomes that much easier to take the next step to make the purchase. I'm just going to add, even when you employ these tactics to overcome procrastination, you'll still see a lot of times the majority of the sales will come in in the last day or even the last couple of hours, because even with them, people will still procrastinate. Oh, yeah, they will. But there will be a point at which they can't procrastinate anymore because it's not available. So, yep, that's yes. I'm I'm not saying that you're going to give them new healthy habits. I'm just saying you're going to get them to stop procrastinating before it's too late. Yep, absolutely. Okay, well, that's it for today. All right. Is Oh man, okay. This might get cut out of the show. I don't know. I'm lucky enough to have a copy an audiobook copy of this book. Is it available anywhere or is it just the only way people can get even nuggets of it is through the podcast? I'm seriously thinking of making it available in a different form uh, in a few months. Okay. But All right. It, it, it is available. You can, you can find there. I think there are a few copies, a few legacy copies or used copies on Amazon, but not many. All right. Well, my plug for it again is just the way that it was delivered was so far ahead of its time and it makes perfect sense now. And uh, I think that if you're lucky enough to get your hands on it, you'll find a lot of value in it. If you're not lucky enough to get your hands on it, make sure that you go back and check out the previous episodes that we've done on it and all of the previous episodes of the Copywriters Podcast over at copywriterspodcast.com. And until next time, David, we will catch you later. Catch you later.